Okay, um, thank you, Spencer and Bill for putting this on. So I'm going to focus on dust um, and just try to kind of take you into the deep time record of dust, start by kind of defining what I mean by dust and then uh, explaining what we've seen in a lot of Western Equatorial Pangaea, the Western US, Western Central US. And, and then I'll go into briefly some, some other regions and then what, can, what dust can do to the system. And the picture I'm beginning with here is the Rico and Halgaito formations or the lower Cutler beds of the Four Corners area. And uh, the Casimovian in this case would probably be way off to the left, um, sort of the, the whitish. What you're seeing here, by the way, is basically glacial interglacials. Um, the the whitish rocks on the left tend to be limestones, marine limestones. Um, and then as basically sea level withdrew and you went entirely continental. That's what you're seeing on the right. But the red is uh, for the most part dust. So next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, so defining what we mean by dust. So dust accumulates on land. If it, if it accumulates in a deposit, we call it loose. And that tends to be material that's less than, than silt sized. And because it's less than silt sized, it doesn't saltate it. It travels in suspension and clouds in the atmosphere and then falls out of the atmosphere, um, which is why it, you will see later, it, it doesn't form any bedding. Um, basically, it, it's kind of massive. The fine fraction of that, the less than 10 micron fraction, uh, which is sometimes referred to sensu stricto as, as dust, as, as opposed to sort of dust in general, encompassing everything that's, that's suspended as fines, um, can travel thousands of kilometers. And of course, Oklahoma is well known for its dust. Um, in the recent, uh, the picture up on the right is a picture from the infamous Dust Bowl of the 1930s, uh, when dust was raised from Oklahoma and places west and made it you know, off to, I, th I think one day, I can't remember the day, it was that it made it over Washington, D.C., and that's when finally the, the Congress started to take, take notice of Oklahoma's dust. Um, as I said, if it falls basically on land, it's deposited as loose, um, but it can also be captured, it's going to fall wherever it falls, so it can be captured in wet, um, wet mud flats, carbonate shelves, and so forth. And the significance is, I like to say, it's both an archive and an agent of climate and climate change. So next slide. <clears throat> Well, we're in COVID time, so I thought I would compare dust to COVID. So on the lower left, you can see the coronavirus, size of the coronavirus, and uh, then going all the way up to a human hair, kind of just out of the view on, on the right there. Um, that 90 micron sand grain is sand, not, not dust, <clears throat> but basically everything else would be, <clears throat> pardon me, considered dust size. Next slide. <clears throat> Okay, so dust is an archive uh, of climate. The most well-known place on the planet today where this is used as an archive would be the Chinese Los Plateau. So the image on the left is um, basically a log of part of the Los Plateau. L is Los, S are paleosols, so it's Los Paleosol, Los Paleosol. And it was discovered back in the 80s uh, that that Los Plateau record provides a very high resolution record of Northern Hemisphere glaciation. And the way that was discovered was by magnetostratigraphically dating the LUS and being able therefore to correlate it to the oxygen isotope record, um, deep sea oxygen isotope record. And it turns out to be a beautiful record of glacials and interglacials. On the right is an example of LUS caught in a different environment, in this case, ice. Um, you know, when we drill ice cores, one of the things that is, that is looked for is the dust component because the dust can tell us which way the winds were blowing and so forth. Next slide. <clears throat> dust is also an agent of climate change. And uh, the way that it does that is both directly and indirectly. So by directly, I mean that it can scatter and absorb solar radiation. Um, but then indirectly, all, all, of the, all of the red, um, all of the letters in red on this, on this plot are ways that, that dust influences the, the climate system. Um, and the indirect ways are by um, iron fertilization. So fertilization of both marine ecosystems and continental ecosystems. Next slide. <clears throat> if we look at where dust is on the planet today, in terms of loose deposits, 
Um, you'll notice that most of them, that they're characteristically at mid to higher latitudes, say something like 35 to 60 north, um, and then fewer, but still present south, especially in Argentina, for example. And these LUS deposits, uh, at one point, well, still, I think, LUS is um, oftentimes referred to as a quaternary phenomenon because it's very well known in the quaternary record because a lot of this material, the vast majority of it, is produced by glacial grinding. And so that's why it has this the distribution that you see here, that it, it basically hugs the edges of ice sheets or it's, it comes out um, in terms of river systems that carry it, for example, the Mississippi River here in the US, that's carried it farther south and then it blows off floodplains and so forth. Next slide. If we go to the, the dust sensu stricto, the less than 10 micron sources, then we start to come into lower latitude regions because if you look at this plot, a lot of the, um, the dust sources, such as the dustiest place on the planet today, the, we the West Africa Baudelaire Depression, <clears throat> those are uh, basically warm desert um, production of, of dust. <clears throat> it tends to be um, finer or coarser than, than the glacial loess size. And uh, in the case of the Baudelaire Depression, the dustiest place today, all of that dust that wafts off of West Africa is for the most part deflating off of um, dry lake beds, such as the area of former Lake Megachad uh, and so forth. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, that's enough on, on the quaternary. Let's dive into deep time now and look at the, uh, the late Paleozoic, the subject of this conference. And uh, this plot is just highlighting ice houses in, in geologic time. So we live in an ice house today and we've got a planet with a lot of loess on it. Loess covers 10%, quaternary loess covers 10% of the land area today. So let's dive back into the pen perm. We all know when that was, so go on to the next slide. And I'm going to focus in on Western Equatorial Pangaea, which for me is, is uh, the Western US. <clears throat> and the, the boxed area in general. And this is a plot from Scotese, Chris Scotese, the Paleomap project. And the kind of blob that's in that box on the left is essentially what we refer to as the ancestral Rocky Mountains, rather you know, simplified on this plot, but that's okay. <clears throat> so we, we all know that I'm, since this is a, a conference on the Casamovian, I'm showing the time slice of the Casamovian from Scotese's Paleomap. And it's quite clear whether it's, uh, John Isbell will talk about this, but whether there were mini ice sheets or a single ice sheet, there was a lot of ice in the Southern polar region. So it was an ice house climate. <clears throat> the the, um, the um, continents had come together to form the supercontinent of Pangaea. So we have that massive um, central Pangaean mountain orogenic belt, uh, very loosely referred to as central Pangaean mountains, but we all know it, a series of orogenic belts and um, a fair number of apyric seas around. Next slide. <clears throat> By about later in the early Permian, uh, we have the waning ice, ice house climate. Um, in the Sac Marion, much of that Gondwana ice collapsed. Um, ultimately, we would be left with, with ice only in, in Australia after this time. Um, still Pangaea, of course, but fewer apyric seas at this time because of just because of the hypsography of Pangaea. Next slide. So what I'm going to do first is go over work that I've done some time ago um, across the, the Western US. And this is a compilation from a paper of about a decade ago, a compilation of units um, spanning the late Carboniferous Permian um, in these localities all around. Some of these I've studied in detail, others in this paper were, were compilations from the literature. So you'll notice the outlines of the Western US states. You'll see the antler origin on the west, the Washtam Marathon, Suture on the south, and then the blobs here, the, the sort of, um, I don't know what colors are those, tan, tan brown to um, uh, mauve, I don't know, <laughs> whatever color that is. The blobs are the uplifts uh, commonly referred to as the, the greater ancestral Rocky Mountains. The, the core ancestral Rocky Mountains are really in the, the Rocky Mountain states, but then, for example, in Oklahoma, we have the Wichita uplift um, signified here as AWU, um, the Amarillo Wichita uplift, which is also considered an ancestral Rocky Mountains uplift. <clears throat> 
So uh, the numbers, the circles and numbers are, um, will refer to a series of stratigraphic columns that I'll show in the next slide. And then I'm going to highlight a couple, oh, sorry, I wasn't quite done, but, but almost there. <laughs> I'm gonna highlight the numbers um, 10 and 13 around the Uncompahgre uplift and also over in Oklahoma 21. So now the next slide, thank you. Um, okay, that's this, this series of columns and it goes from the west, number one, the northwest, off to um, basically just east, east of Oklahoma on the southeast, number 22, um, stratigraphic columns. And what you see here is in the blue and the gray colors are either lithologically mixed or marine carbonates. Um, for example, the, the um, gray are kind of cyclothemic. All of them are cyclothemic really, but the blue are limestone dominated. Uh, then the, the brownish are um, in general, silty marine clastics, and then the yellow eolian so sandstone, and then the orange color um, are the, the silty continental strata, many of which are lusses, paleolusses. So I'm going to focus in and show you a couple of examples of these. Right in the middle are highlighted the maroon formation and the cutler group. And then off to the right, the upper right is um, part of the, the Blaine in Oklahoma. So go to the next slide, please. Okay, so these are um, big piles of lus or lucite. Okay, um, first recognize so that the lower left is the maroon formation in Colorado. It's not entirely lus, but here it is. This is near Basalt, Colorado, and this was first recognized as lus by um, Sam Johnson of the USGS in 1989. Uh, we went through and did some detailed work on it to recognize the Lus and Paleosols, and you can see an, an enlarged view of that in, in the um, top, uh, top, top left here. Uh, and then over on the right is a picture of the lower Cutler beds, that, similar to the picture I began the talk with uh, in Utah, about 250 meters of lower Cutler beds here. And those were first interpreted as Lus by Kathleen Murphy, and she was a student of Dave Loops, at, at, I think at Nebraska at the time. Uh, and we came in and, and um, again, sort of studied those in detail to characterize the, the paleosols and the Lusses and look at their magnetic susceptibility and so forth. These are huge piles of Lus, and I used to call them the thickest piles of dust on the planet um, until I got to Oklahoma and started to, to recognize that. So let's go on to Oklahoma. Next slide, please. So um, that's my little joke. I always have to make it. Dust is the reason Oklahoma is a red state. Um, it's going to be hard to make it not red. But <laughs> anyway, what you're looking at here is the on the strat column to the right um, are the units from the Permian of Oklahoma. And you're looking at the lower El Reno group here. Um, from a place called the Glass Mountains in Oklahoma. Um, so next slide, what I'd like to do now is just very quickly take you through what are the attributes that make us call this stuff loose or, or very um, generally dust. And the first is the grain size, which tends to be silt, fine to coarse silt. And you're seeing it here several different um, thin section photomicrographs of um, not just loose, but Aeolian siltstone, um, however you want to call it, dust that fell into the marine environment, such as the, the one with the letter F that has a crinoid in the middle of it, uh, right? But all of this is, is um, fine to coarse silt. Next slide. Um, here's some grain size analyses. We're able to um, disaggregate these in many cases in Oklahoma because the Permian of Oklahoma has never been very deeply buried, so we can run it through a, a protocol and actually successfully disaggregate it and run it through a laser particle size analyzer. So on the lower left is a really classic loose um, pattern with a median uh, size there of 27.2 microns going up to something that's really clay up in the upper right around um, really around uh, three or four microns. That happens to be from a unit called the flower pot shale of Oklahoma. Next slide. Another attribute is that these tend to be laterally continuous. And I'm going back to the photo I showed just a moment ago. You, you can't really see any channels here or so forth. Next slide. Because uh, dust falls out of the atmosphere, out of suspension, and is not saltated the way that helium sand is, it tends to form internally massive units that, uh, you know, the bedding um, 
is really formed by the intervening paleosols in a, in a true lust deposit. So for example, this is a picture from the maroon formation. The, the beds were up to eight meters thick and they were just internally massive at, at fractures conchoidally like a piece of, of obsidian. Next slide. Um, tends to be an absence of feeder channels. Again, they, they look for all the world perhaps like something you would call a floodplain deposit, except that you can never find the, the fluvial channel. <laughs> Next slide. And then common paleosols, and this is Kathy Benison here on a field trip to Oklahoma, and you're looking at some of the um, paleosol horizons in the background in, in this list deposit. Next slide. Okay, so all of that that I just showed you is LUS or, or paleolus or LUSite, however you want to refer to it. But what happens if this material falls not on the ground, not on uh, in a continental area, but in a pyrex seas? So next slide, because we had a lot of those during the Chasmovian. So I'll show you an analog, which would be that basically it will fall wherever it's going to fall. And that includes into the water, and therefore into, for example, carbonate platforms. In this case, I'm showing uh, a Pleistocene beach rock from Puerto Rico. On uh, next slide, if we look more closely at, at this, this is what it looks like, a cut face on the right and the, the weathered face on the left. And, and what you see here is it's, it's limestone. There are no rivers coming into this area, but uh, there's a lot of dust, that dust from West Africa together with the dust from the Lesser Antilles Arc and so forth. So it's both a mix of, in this case, um, volcanic sources and continental sources um, from West Africa. Next slide. So let's go back to that diagram that I showed a little while ago and um, put on, highlight the Chasmovian. And what you can see here is the Chasmovian is a bit of a transition period, right? Between, you know, above that line and at least in the Western US, you see a lot of these true continental loss deposits um, because again, the continental freeboard of Pangaea was um, changing and you had a lot more land area, um, uh, but also a lot of production and accumulation of dust. Uh, whereas, whereas below, um, we tended to be, you know, dust that was falling into marine environments and more dilute than what was happening um, later. Next slide. So let me show you what these what dust that falls into marine environments looks like. Um, the ideal place to be able to do this is if you've got something like a carbonate mound, and these are uh, this is a scan of an old slide because I haven't been able to get back here in probably 20 years, but this is from the Missile Range of southern New Mexico, and these are big um, phyllodalgal algal mound uh, deposits. So the the one on the um, kind of background there is about 150 meters thick of carbonate, phyllodalgal algal carbonate, so shallow marine carbonates that were isolated from fluvial, um, fluvial influx. So if you can make a paleogeographic case that you're looking at a carbonate platform or carbonate shelf or carbonate mound that was isolated from, from fluvial deltaic influx, then any siliciclastic mater material that's trapped within that carbonate had to have entered the system from the air as a dust deposit. So we can go through these systems and use them basically as analogs to what people do with ice cores, which is to extract the dust component um, and, uh, and therefore you know, play around with that component. So we did that with age equivalent strata to these deposits in uh, the subsurface of West Texas. So next slide, please. So uh, if you first focus on the paleogeographic map from, from Blakey here, this is a, a high stand interval during, um, in this case, kind of the mid-late Pennsylvanian. And we're, look, we're going to be looking at Horseshoe Atoll. It's not a real atoll, real atolls form in the ocean, and this was in a Pyrex Sea, but it was simply a, a very well known in the subsurface, uh, large um, carbonate mound system uh, that build up phyllid carbonate mound system. And so what we did is we looked at an air drilled core from this um, that was uh, available from, I think it was the Texas Bureau at the time. And one of my students went through and sampled at a 20 centimeter interval through that. And that's what you're seeing in the middle of the slide here. Um, 2100, 2090, 2080, those are meters below sea level. Uh, sorry, yeah, meters below modern you know, sea level. So in the subsurface, in other words. 
And you're looking at mostly carbonate, but a little bit of clastic mud rock. And you can see the weight percent dust or the clastic mud, mud essentially that we pulled out of this carbonate. Um, we do a sequential process where we dissolve the limestone and then we combust the organics and oxidize the pyrite and then dissolve the, the pyrite. And then we um, look at it to see if, if we've got any orthogenic material left. And then we can do both the, the weight percent of the dust and the grain size of the dust and so forth. So you're seeing at the bottom here, the SB refers to a sequence boundary. That's a glacial low stand. And then the picture on the right shows what that looks like in the core. It's a beautiful paleosol calcrete on top of the carbonate. You can see the root traces and so forth. And then this clastic mud rock. And when we first logged it, we thought, oh, okay, this is a marine, you know, this looks like a marine mud rock because it's dark, it's got some pyrite and so forth. But as we looked at it in more detail, we realized that there were pedogenic features, both macroscopic and microscopic, and that this had, this classic material had entered the system when uh, Horseshoe Atoll was exposed as an island and fell during, uh, fell on top of it during glacial low stand, and then was transgressed over during the subsequent high stand. And uh, when you calculate the, the dust fluxes through here, the dust flux at glacials exceeded that at interglacials by 400 to 4,000 times. Massive amount of dust coming in at glacial low stands. Next slide. Okay, so one question is, there's a lot of dust, we think, in the Western US and in Western Equatorial Pangaea. So, and, and it's kind of strange because it's equatorial, but where did it all come from? And you need to generate the material. You need to generate a lot of silt size material. And then you need to transport it, which probably is a combination of both river and wind transport. And then you need to dust, then you need to trap it in a dust trapping region. So next slide, please. So this is a good way to look at provenance is using detrital zircon geochronology. So we've, we've done uh, a bit of this over the years. The plot that you see is called a relative age probability plot. So you see the age in zero to four billion years ago on the, on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis is the relative probability of ages. So the area under the curve sums to one and the peakedness of, of any given peak here is a function of both the number of grains that are giving us that age and the error bars on, on those um, ages. And ultimately we're, what we're trying to get at here is, interestingly in the Western US, most of the lower middle Paleozoic was carbonate. And the first time we were really exposing basement material that was zircon bearing was during all of these orogenies that were happening in uh, the later Paleozoic. Um, Carboniferous Permian, right? And so that's when we were releasing those zircons. And so especially early on in that history during the late Carboniferous and Permian, we can use the zircons to trace them back to their sources um, because they weren't necessarily recycled since there wasn't anything to recycle um, underneath until you hit the basement material. So the, um, the plots that you're seeing here are through time, um, older to younger, and they're the sum of several samples uh, and therefore many grains. And the, the bottom line here, coded by color, is that we're seeing sources from the Yavapai Mazatzal, which would be the ancestral Rocky, the, the basement core in the ancestral Rocky Mountains. Then we're seeing a lot of evidence for um, basement that would have come from the Grenville, that's the southeast, and Neoproterozoic and paleo grains, uh, Paleozoic grains, from the Appalachian. So largely the Appalachians with some contributions from the ancestral Rockies. Next slide, please. So if we look at transport pathways, we had this big orogenic belt on the east as well as in the west. So we generated it in those mountains, transported it off the mountains, that's the blue arrows in these uh, river systems that drain the mountains, and then zonal and monsoonal winds, those are the uh, white arrows coming from both the east and the west, um, ultimately trapped it, next slide please, in this big nice trapping region <laughs> that was subsiding, or at least a lot of basins were subsiding in the western US. Next slide. Okay, let's finish up with some dust beyond the equator. So we're going to look at, uh, we've been focusing our time on that sort of pinkish or mauve colored arrow, uh, sorry not arrow, star in the western, western equatorial Pangaea. When we look at it in the global view, you can see why it would have been a big sink for a lot of dust. Um, you know, it was, it was downwind and downslope of a huge dust producing region. Um, 
So I'm going to start by showing you, go over, take your eye over to the right to Japan, and we're going to go to the equatorial region, but now in the greatest ocean that ever lived, the Panthalassic Ocean, a place that was probably very dust poor. So let's start with the dust rich region. So next slide. So sort of an overview of just of the area I've just been telling you about. This is the um, Four Corners area, the San Juan River, uh, goose next to the San Juan. And you see this beautiful exposure of Mississippian through Permian here and beautifully bedded. If you just focus in on the Pennsylvania, this beautiful bedding is a function really of two things. It's a function of climate change in two ways. One is that, of course, it's glacier used to see. Um, so, but glacier used to see was ultimately climate change. And the other thing that's going on here is that it's a largely carbonate dominated region m much of the time, but you're blowing dust in during the, um, the, the, during one part of the climate uh, phase, right? Um, mostly during one part of the climate phase, during the glacials. And that's a large part of why you get bedding and carbonates. And so next slide, please. If you contrast that with the Panthalassic Ocean, this is the Akiyoshi terrain, the Akiyoshi limestone in Japan. And you just don't see bedding <laughs> because there's very little dust. There is dust, but very little. Next slide. <clears throat> Now let's hop up to Svalbard. That's the north end of this. You're still in a du pretty dust poor region. So next slide. You can see in this picture, um, there's microcodium along the sequence boundary, but not a lot of dust. And, and you see that reflected and not, not a very strong bedding signal there. Next slide. If instead we go down to Bolivia and Iran and look at the carbonates that we're forming basically in proximity to the Gondwan and uh, glaciers, next slide. We do see um, dust. Here's Iran, here's a sequence boundary with the dust in, in the field. And here's some modeling that looks at the interglacial versus glacial uh, dust emission and dust deposition. Um, by the, the physical evidence, the data shows us that the dust fluxes were up to almost 20 times greater during glacial phases. The models don't show as much of that because um, probably because they, they don't model the, the dust um, production very well. Um, next slide. And then in Bolivia, similar sort of thing. Here's a sequence bounding um, dusty interval. The, the clasts there are, are not clastic clasts. They're, they're basically carbonate clasts um, with dust surrounding it. And this is coming in uh, from both volcanic emissions, in this case, and from um, continental dust. Next slide. So speaking of uh, volcanism, this is a, um, a nod to some of the volcanism that was happening during this time, which was quite high during the Chasmovian and especially explosive volcanism was quite high. So the sources for this dust are really three, glacial, arid lands, arid continental regions, and volcanism. Next slide. So finally, I'll finish with how can loss and dust change climate? Let's return to this idea of the iron fertilization effect. And this is showing a dust plume coming off of the Copper River Delta. This dust is glacial dust. Next slide. Um, we did some work with Tim Lyons and, um, and his postdoc at the time, Jeremy Owens, looking at um, what is defined as high, um, uh, sorry, highly reactive iron. And um, what we found was that in both the loose deposits and in the loose derived from, uh, or the, the dust, the Aeolian dust, if you will, sorry, marine deposited dust, um, we have really high values of highly reactive iron. And that's interpreted to be bioavailable iron. Next slide. So if you plot this plot, which is a ratio on the y-axis of highly reactive to total iron, and then on the y-axis um, iron uh, to aluminum, you see the modern loss sitting fairly low on this. And then you see all of those other colors that represent our Pennsylvanian Permian loss and the Horseshoe Atoll mud rock uh, with incredibly high values of highly reactive iron. So what we're seeing is an enhancement of the reactivity of the iron pool that's interpreted to have been very good for, uh, or what should I say? Yeah, very good for primary producers. Next slide. We corroborated this in the Iranian samples. You're looking here at, again, uh, highly reactive to total iron on the x-axis in this case. And then you're looking at counts of different biota and the autotrophs in particular, which is the curve in the black, um, really, are stimulated by 
um, by the highly reactive iron until they're saturated at about you know, 0.8 or so. Next slide. So I'll conclude by saying that there's a lot of dust out there. Um, it falls into wherever it's going to fall, whether that be marine or continental settings. And it reflects, uh, we think, a remarkable dustiness. Uh, I guess I'll say that the, um, the thickest loose deposits on the planet come from this time period, um, at least so far recognized. Um, we, it was delivered to Western Equatorial Pangaea, mainly from the Central Pangaean Mountains via both zonal and monsoonal winds that would have been deflating fluvial systems. And the dust and carbonates of mid-latitudes of Pangaea was sourced from a variety of, of sources, glacial, volcanic, and arid. Really, all of the systems are, are sourced that way. It's just that, you know, whatever you're closest to, right, will dominate. And in Western Equatorial Pangaea, it seems that the Chasmovian was a transition between dust captured marine systems and true loose deposits. And it's worth paying attention to because it affects climate and ecosystems, both directly and indirectly. Next slide, please. And a lot of people have participated in this work over the years, both um, uh, uh, faculty and so forth, um, as well as a lot of students at OU. So, so they're pictured here, and I thank NSF for their support. Um, and that's it. I think I have one more slide that's just an art piece. So, dust of, of Oklahoma. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Um, are there questions? Okay, I have a question. Um, you're, you're familiar, Lynn, with uh, Blaine Cecil's work where he talks about dust or silica blown in to Pennsylvanian marine limestones, for example, being the source of a lot of the chert that we see in those marine limestones. And I'm wondering what you think of that idea and whether you've looked at that, because I've looked at a lot of Pennsylvania limestones and you see everything from chert bands to nodules to whatever, but I'm not sure it looks particularly cyclic or anything of, of that ilk. Could you comment on that? Yes, yeah, I think I think Blaine's right on. I mean, I, I, there, you know, as many things, there's there might be multiple things going on, but I I think that that fine the really ultra fine dust in particular, because even though uh, let's say that you're glacially grinding material, um, you're going to produce a lot of a, a lot of silt, but you're also going to produce a lot of um, clay sized material. You know, the less than four micron, and it's highly reactive because it has large surface area. And it's falling into um, basically in, in a carbonate environment, it's falling into something that is essentially, um, you know, making it more soluble. And in fact, we've seen direct evidence. I'm going to try to kind of make a little picture here. We've seen direct evidence for, for this at times when you can see cores of a silt grain um, that's basically covered by a, um, I don't know if you can see that or not, but, but, but you know, um, covered by a, or overprinted by um, orthogenic silica, which makes it difficult, by the way, to do, we, we carefully screen this. So when we, we get our um, essentially silicate residue, we have to look at it and see if there's chert in it, right? Because we don't want to be taking the grain size of chert. However, a lot of that chert material was probably sourced by ultrafine um, silica dust. So I think that, um, that he's probably right. You know, There are other sources, hydrothermal sources, um, things like that, but, but I think that um, the aerosol source is an important one. So your work, you know, you're saying that you get glacial interglacial cycles in lussites that are recorded by paleosols and then luss, uh, have you tried to work on the marine limestones looking at chert distribution to see if that mimics or gives you the same signal? I haven't, no. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Okay. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Bill DeMichael. Bill, can you turn on your video and audio, please? Sure. Hey, Lynn. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. One, um, I was down in, in the red beds in Texas, which of course are Permian, not Casamovian. And Dan Cheney and I were digging through some stuff um, at one of our sites uh, there and kept saying, there's no grain size change here. We see roots occasionally, but no grains. It was like, it was three meters thick. Um, and 
your comment that things that look like floodplains, but there's no channels, um, really strikes home. I, I think I've seen that stuff in parts of the early Permian red beds that could definitely be interpreted that way. Um, I know that Dory Contreras at the um, Perot Museum has started back up working on the Wagoner Ranch. And if you had, or a student had any interest in that, um, we could point you uh, to her and to some places where we've seen these kinds of deposits. Um, they might be keep, keeping with what you're already seeing in Oklahoma, of course, because they're about the same age. Yeah, no, thank you. I, yeah, I think that this region was um, a dust bowl before the dust bowl, yeah. <laughs> I have a question too for you or for, for some others that are out there perhaps. Um, this noting that the Casamovian was a time of great volcanism. Um, as I recall from what John Isbell's published earlier, it also was a time of great ice melting. Um, and, and other people have published, Phil Heckel, Mike Regal and all about the, the high stand of sea level at that time, which would be melting, get, you're getting the water from somewhere, wherever it's coming from. Um, and if you're putting dust, beginning to put dust in the air and you're beginning to have a lot of volcanism, um, is that balanced off against CO2 coming out of the volcanoes? It's causing warming because you know, volcanism seems to cause the nuclear winter. So um, why would the Casamovian not be colder? And it, it's a good question and it, it's all about the time scale. So, so volcanoes can cool or warm depending on what they're doing on the, on the time scale that we look at geologically. So on a human time scale, like you know, well demonstrated by Pinatubo, if you have a really explosive eruption, you can cool the climate for the next year or so. Now, if that's just sort of a one-off, um, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna do much. But if you were to kind of punch the, so, so the, a volcano on the short time scale is a climate perturbation. In other words, it perturbs the climate, cools it, and then it returns to where it was. If you've got massive amounts of volcanism spewing out CO2, it's a forcing. So you're pushing, pushing, pushing the system. So in general, um, we've always said that, okay, a single volcano um, cools the climate, but you know, massive volcanism over thousands and hundreds, hundreds of thousands, you know, the decan traps or things like that um, warms the climate because it's the CO2 effect. So, so it depends on the time scale. So when we published that um, paper a couple of years ago where we said, gee, there was a lot of explosive volcanism, could this have contributed to, you know, everything else that was going on, low CO2, low solar luminosity and so forth. Um, that it's a hypothesis, but it would have to be tested. And the way it would have to be tested would be to look at the time scale of those punches to the system. If you were punching the system in the right place at the right time scale, you could cool it, even though we normally think of cooling as a short-term phenomenon. Um, did that did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank, that's great, yeah. But then thanks for the talk. I've got a whole page of notes here, so <laughs> that was quite exciting. Appreciate it. Okay, we, there's another question from Andre Jasper, Andre, can you turn on your video and audio, please? Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, I am really curious about, uh, I am talking from, from Gondwana, so from Western Gondwana, and I, I'm really cu curious about how to, in the field, uh, how you can differentiate uh, ashes and dust. Because we have a lot of, of uh, uh, layers here, uh, they are interpreted as, as uh, ashes. And uh, okay, in some way, uh, perhaps we can be looking to dust in some times. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm just curious about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So we did have in the, in the Bolivian section in particular, we had a mix of both actually discrete ashes, you know, and, and the way that, that uh, we could tell in this case, it, it was definitely an, an ash fall, a discrete layer um, in the system rather than dispersed throughout in the carbonate in this case. And a couple of ways you could do it would be to first, um, uh, if it's a discrete layer, as opposed to 
to um, kind of throughout. If you truly had a, a loess deposit where you have volcanism happening during, you know, the continental silt deposition, you could have a, a complete mix, and that happens in the um, in the um, Cenozoic. Uh, I think it's the Owl. I want to say the Owl Creek or Owl. I'm not getting this right, but it's uh, kind of in, in the Nebraska area. This happens where you have have you had volcanism and and um, and loss coming into, into the system. But one of the things you could look for, for example, is you know, if, the, if the dominant mineral is quartz, then it's probably more loss dominated because um, that's the, the main mineralogy. Uh, whereas if you have, you know, if you were to extract zircons and you had a bunch of zircons all of the same age, then, then you're probably looking at, at an ash deposit and looking at the clay mineralogy and that type of thing. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, questioners. We're gonna, it's time to move on to the next talk, which is by John Isbell, and he's gonna talk about the late Paleozoic Ice Ages.